It's a good day to serve Amen. the Lord today, isn't it? Amen. 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 Yeah. We want to welcome each of you today, and special to our welcome to our television audience and our those watching by on uh, YouTube and also on uh, Facebook. We're just happy to have y'all here. We're going to start out today with a song called What a Day That Will Be. It's number 314 in your hymn book. Number 314. My voice is still a little low, so I hope that I don't put you all in the basement. We'll see how it works. All right. 314. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forevermore on a happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace then he'll take me by the hand and lead me through the promised land what a day glorious day that to be there is no sorrow there no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I shall be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that to be. What a day that to be when my Jesus Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and forever I will be with a day, glorious day, that will be, let's sing that last course again, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, then he'll take me by the hand and lead me through that promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. Sorry, I blew that one. We're going to have prayer this morning. And, uh, my uh, brother David's little granddaughter hasn't been feeling good. She's got an intestinal infection. And has to pray for her. That's, uh, and which one it is? It's one of the twins. Evan L. Evan L. And so she's been in a lot of pain in her stomach. And so we want to pray for Evan L this morning. And uh, Gloria. Gloria. Mm -hmm. My little granddaughter, She's seven, has to have hip surgery. Oh, it's seven. Thursday. Oh. Then at the Children's Joy Hospital. Mm. That, that's Anna? Annika. Annika. Yeah. Okay. I will try to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. And then Carson Zoll. Who is that, Carson Zoll? Yeah, Arlene's brother in law. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's not going to make it, I don't think. Mm. Oh, no. Mm. Yeah. Aren't you glad we've got a big guy? Amen. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, praise God. The family needs attention. Yeah. You know, there's just so many people today that are battling depression. Feeling of total hopelessness. And just wondering if there is any reason for keeping on. Yeah, there's a 
there's a family in Fertilum, I'm not sure who they are, but there was a killing or something, mm -hmm. just, just pray for them. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah, well, it was kind of cold this week, so. You gave it to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I told, called uh, Carolyn yesterday, and, or she called us, and I said, uh, I got rid of my cold. Good. I said, yeah, I gave it to Mom. <laughs> Father, we thank you that we could bring our request to you today. You're big enough to handle it. Lord, we know that sometimes we get overpowered by all the serious things going on in people's lives. But Lord, it never overpowers you. And so we cast our cares at your feet today. And we ask you to pick them up and carry them. Lord, we just pray for Annika that she is, she's going through this surgery, Lord. She's so little. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would just touch her and grant mercy. Lord, you know the fear, not knowing what's going to happen. Father, we pray you would just bless her and the surgeon too that does the surgery. And glorify your name, Jesus. Just glorify your name. We pray for the Zoll family, Lord, that you would just work a miracle there as well. But Lord, we know that there's power in prayer. So we're asking, Lord, for your healing and your mercy. We pray, Lord, for Gloria too, that you would touch her today. Lord, she needs the touch of God upon her life. Bring healing, Lord, you know all the struggles she's going through. Lord, hold her close. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we pray, pray for Evanel that you would just remove, Lord, that, that uh, infection that she's got. God, set her free from it and give her her health. Again, take away the pain. We pray, Lord, for her, that you would just touch Lois, too, and just take that cold away and dispose of it. We claim healing. And, Lord, we pray for Carolyn and Troy as they're trying to sell their house now. Lord, show them where they are to live. And, Lord, give them your wisdom. And, Lord, we know it's hard on the kids to know that their house that they've lived in their whole life will no longer be home. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would work a miracle even there. Father, we pray for all those who are despondent today, those who feel that there's no hope in America, and there's no place to go, no place to run. And so many are running to suicide, and we know that's not the answer. God, we need revival in America. So bring that revival, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the God who can do that. Lord, lift our eyes to Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's uh, turn our hymn book to number... Number 58. Number 58. You know, we, uh, it's something how things, how it would make thoughts come to your mind. Yesterday, as Nathan and Shar came to visit us, they get, we see them so seldom. And their, uh, their little youngest daughter now, she's not talking, she's not walking yet, but she's crawling. And I was sitting holding her, and she started getting restless. She was watching her older sister playing on the floor. 
she started kind of getting squirmy, and so I just set her down on the floor, and she sat right by my feet and stayed there. And I thought to myself, you know, the place where there's peace for us to sit at the feet of Jesus and to rest next to him. Let's do that, 58. 58. And get right key, so. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say. you would guide them and direct them and Lord give them willing hearts to follow your leading. Lord we know that these are very troubled times and so Lord we pray you would speak to their hearts and Lord you give them listening ears that they will hear the voice of God and be willing to follow them. And Lord as they lead us 
May they lead us down the path that you would have them go. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Scripture this morning is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 4 and 5. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through, the, through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, that's kind of a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's hard to, to rest in the Lord and to keep our minds focused on Him. There's so many things going on and all the fears. It's so easy to listen to all the fears and the things that are being said around us. We have to continue to flee back to the Word of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he brings peace to the heart. And you know, when, when the Lord spoke to me a few weeks ago now, and, uh, and he said to me, he says, I will show you the things you must, you must learn and you must know in these times ahead. It brought me just great peace. He's in charge. Amen. We're going to do some choruses here today. And let's start with uh, number 39 in your chorus book. Now, I know you all got the same words for that. <laughs> number 39. Did you find the chorus book? Okay. One of these days we're going to get new ones printed. But, uh, in fact, we got them down there. We got enough of yeah, but. Anyway, I will shout hallelujah. And it's okay in this church to shout hallelujah. Yes, praise the Lord. You know, we're not of the frozen chosen. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, we shout hallelujah. Okay. I will shout hallelujah, praise his name, to the Lord who never be a saint. He has placed me by his blood, all because of his great love. I will shout hallelujah, praise his name, I will clap my hands unto the Lord. I rejoice at the reading of his word, for thanksgiving in my heart and you know when God is our judge he's also our heavenly father we don't have to be afraid no. you know we can come right into his presence I don't remember the picture years ago when John Kennedy was the president and and, uh, and John, John Jr. was this little and his daddy was having an important meeting you know, in the in the uh, in his office in the old room there, oh the old office. And cameras were on everything, and, and all of a sudden the door pops open, and here comes a little guy carrying a flag, and he was carrying it sideways, and it didn't fit through the door. But he didn't care if you know what was going on in there. He just knew that was his daddy. 
And door opened up, he come rushing in, and the fly, fly caught him both ends, and he did a flip over the fly. But he ended up in the office. And this ended up on national television. And, uh, you know, it's just a kind of reminder to us, you know, that uh, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help in time of need. Praise the Lord. I will enter his gates. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his thoughts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. He hath made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. I will enter his case with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. Oh, amen. Drums didn't short up. <laughs> oh, bless the Lord. Uh, we're going to go over to 45. And uh, before we sing this and go on, I uh, just want to mention our, our announcements coming up for this week. Um, Starting on Tuesday morning, we have our telecast on Garden Valley Cable at 10 o'clock. And then on uh, Wednesday, we have Bible study over at Sharon's at 6.30. And uh, we're studying the book of Revelation. We'll be going to chapter 4. And uh, it's, a, it's a fun chapter. It's a fun book to read about because everything we're reading about is all coming so quick. And uh, and so it's just it's just fun living in that in that uh, book right now. So that's six thirty Wednesday night. What's that? We're blessed when we read it. Oh yeah, we sure are. We are blessed. Praise the Lord. And then coming up on uh, uh, next next Sunday again, we have our Sunday school at nine thirty and. Worship at 11. Anything else that, that I'm missing? Any? All right. All right. Praise the Lord. But anyway, let's. Uh, what did I say? In my life, Lord, number 45. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. Be
COVID thing going on. It's just a lot of people are so afraid. And then with the with the mask thing that's been passed now, I can't wear one. Um, if I wore my mask, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. But then we're far enough apart so you don't have to worry. And the microphone doesn't pick up germs and throw it out to you bigger than it was. So you don't have to worry about that. So the mask can come later. But, uh, and then another problem with a preacher, you know, is that uh, I've heard this so many times, if I can't see your lips, I have a hard time hearing. And, uh, and it's, that's true, you know, you walk up somebody wearing a mask and, and if your hearing isn't good, you can't understand them. You, you, you find that you, you read people's lips without realizing it. And, uh, but anyway, we are, we are safe. He is Lord, He is Lord, He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue come. right now as we learn who you are Lord we know we realize that so many people just refer to you as God but their ideas about who you are are so vague and we ask this morning that you would take the vagueness away as we study the names of God and learn your personality, learn what you're all about. We need to know you. So teach us, we pray. Amen. Special 
this morning, but Lois can't sing. And so, unless some of you want to get up here and do a special. We're talking about the names of God. We start out with that He is the great I Am, which pretty much says it all, but it's kind of vague in the sense that God is God. He is everything. If you look at who God is, He is, He says everything. And then we went to the next one. God is the God Almighty. By the way, I hope you don't mind. I've got my, my coffee up here and it's in a different thing because it doesn't get, get cold. My voice starts cutting out and I've still got my warm coffee and I don't have to send the host at home to get me hot. So, anyway, he's the Almighty. And then the next thing we found out, he is El Eon. Jehovah Elion, which means God most high, creator and possessor of heaven and earth. And if God is the God of everything, if he owns everything, he created everything, by right of creation, God has the right to set all the rules. And God does not have a committee to go through. He is almighty God. He is El Elyon, which means he can set the rules because it's his world. And then he is El Shaddai, all-powerful, all-sufficient. He has all the power you need. And, uh, and you know you can't beat that, can you? He has no weaknesses whatsoever. You know, you can look at people and some look big and strong, but inside there is a weakness someplace. Back years ago when we were down in Watertown, I was preaching this one Sunday morning that uh, I said, I walked down the street one day and then I saw a man walking into the bank. And you see, at that point, all the suits that I wore were hand-me-downs. Different people came and they'd give me a suit, you know, and said, I can't wear it anymore. And so I ended up with a whole bunch of suits. But they were all pretty old. But that's all right, they still covered everything, you know. <laughs> And so I was just happy for him. I couldn't afford to buy him this suit, especially with four babies and four little ones. And all, uh, everything we had went in diapers. I mean, we had, we, we had so many diapers, going through so many diapers. I dreamt one night uh, that uh, a semi backed up to our house. The guy got out, opened the door, and it was plump, full of pampers. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I was getting all these hand-me-down suits, and I was, I really appreciate it. But I watched, and one day, I saw this man walking into the bank, and he had a very expensive suit on. I mean, he looked so sharp, and I thought to myself, and now this, my, all my flesh hadn't died yet at that point, but it still hasn't, but. Uh, and I saw that man, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice to be able to go there and to find into a nice expensive clothing store for men and pick out a suit that was like that really nice and good and sharp and everything. Would I ever feel good? And then the Lord spoke to me and he said, the man may have a good suit on on the outside, but what you don't know, what's inside that suit? There may be cancer in that man's body. Would you want that with it? And all of a sudden I realized, you know, the suit wasn't important. I preached this in church. And uh, the following Sunday was just happened to be my birthday. And, uh, th and the president of the congregation came up after church with a card and he handed it to me. In fact, it was during the service. And he handed it to me and he said, uh, I opened it up. He said, open it up. And, and there, in, in his card, it says, this is for you to go down to the clothing store here, the men's store, and pick out 
something to suit you. They wanted me to go down and buy a brand new suit. And so I made this announcement. We got a good crowd next Sunday. It says, next Sunday you'll come wearing my birthday suit. <laughs> and then I realized what I said. Of course, everybody was laughing. But I bought my suit and I came and I, I wore it the next Sunday. <clears throat> Nobody was disappointed. But uh, God is the God who is all sufficient and he gives you what you need to have. And then he is also Jehovah Jireh, which we talked about last Sunday. He is the Lord who sees everything, or he sees to it. We can look at the needs that we have. We can look at our situation. Do you know that God can see the whole thing that's going on today in America? God can see the viruses. God can see all the negative things that have got us all uptight. And God is not uptight. God is not worried about what's going on. The only thing that concerns God about this whole thing is how many people are looking away from him instead of to him. You see, if we want to honor God, we will look to him and trust him with our future. And so we go to the next today. And this is found in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus in chapter 15, and we're just going to read from 22 to 27. But let me give you a little background. This is we're jumping ahead from Abraham all the way up to Moses. Israel had been uh, taken from the, their land. Remember what happened in that uh, famine has struck the land of Israel. And, uh, and because the famine had come, they, they had to move to, uh, to Egypt. And there Joseph was the, was the leader of, in Egypt. And he had become the prime minister. And so there, uh, Moses, now, after 400 years, the people had gone into captivity. Everything started out really, really good there in, in Egypt for Israel. And so everything was going great. And then all of a sudden, it started falling apart. The people now have riches. I mean, they have got houses, they've got all their nice things, they've got everything. And so they are living now in pretty good conditions. But now after, after Joseph dies, and another king comes, and there's a whole new, uh, new change in the government, and, uh, and now things start falling apart. And the people become slaves in, in Egypt. They cry out to God. God sends Moses to deliver them. And so you know the story about all the, the plagues that happened in Israel, or in Egypt. And finally, the people are allowed to go. They cross over the, the Red Sea, and they make their journey to, to heading back to the Promised Land. And as they're on their way to the Promised Land, they haven't gone very far before they run out of water. And you know, it's a tough thing, isn't it, when you run out of water? And the hot sun is beating down. Ah, you get so thirsty. And realizing you don't have any water makes you even more thirsty. Because you're thinking about it. And so there, they, they're, they've run out of water, and they look up ahead, and here there is a pool of water. And they're thinking, praise God, we've got water, water, water. And they run to the water. They throw themselves down, face in the water to drink it up. And they find it's bitter. They can't drink it. And they're spitting it out. And they're saying, don't drink it, don't drink it. It's poisonous. It's bitter. And 
they have to stop now. They're complaining to Moses. And so here's what it says. Verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found the water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance. And there he proved it. And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Or you can say, I am Jehovah Rophi. I am Jehovah Rophi. The Lord who heals. The Lord who restores. Oh, praise the Lord. In the midst of another serious situation, God reveals his name. And you know, when, whenever God is going to reveal his name, it's in a time of trial. He didn't just write it in the book and say, okay, here's all my names, so you'll find them useful as you're going down the road. It was when they were in the most dire situation that they learned the name of God. God says, this is who I am. Now, I want you to take a, a look at who those people are. We tend to look at this situation and we say, well, how could they be that bad? I mean, here they've been, they've just been delivered. But back up a little farther. When, when, well, actually, when they come out of there, they've just seen the miracles of God. They have witnessed now Pharaoh, who has been hard, and hardening his heart. Well, backing up further, they had been under Pharaoh. They had been uh, going through all this very, very difficult bondage in Egypt. They cried out to the Lord, and God sends Moses. Now, what would you do if you would have been there, and here comes Moses? You'd be shouting, you'd be, you'd be having a worship service, wouldn't you? You'd be getting together with your friends, and you'd have your hands together, clapping your hands. You'd be swinging your tambourine. You'd be shouting, hallelujah, we are being set free. God has heard our prayer. And things got worse instead. It wasn't what they expected. But you know the whole story because you read it in the book. Little by little, God sends the plagues. And finally, Pharaoh says, go. And now they're, cry they're shouting again, we're leaving, we're, we're leaving our bondage behind and this huge train of people are leaving Egypt. We're heading for the promised land. You see, one of the things that we do is we, it, it, when things got really bad, our, our memories get really good of what things used to be. These people had never, none of these people had ever been to, to the land of promise before. This has been 400 years that they've been in Egypt. But the stories were alive. And they remembered all the stories, and now as they're going through the terrible bondages of Egypt, their memories get better and better, and, and the land of promise becomes more and more and more wonderful. It's almost like heaven to them. And they can't wait to see it one day. They know there's been a promise. And all of a sudden it falls apart in their face. 
because they're heading out and now they reach the sea. What are they going to do? They reach the sea and they can't get through it and they can't go to the left, they can't go to the right and then to their horror they look behind them and here comes Pharaoh and his whole army. Now, wouldn't you think these people would be so full of faith, they say, we have nothing to worry about. Oh, no, they're like us. They murmured. They told Moses, Moses, you brought us out here to die at the hand of Pharaoh. Weren't we better off as slaves? Moses stretches out his rod, the waters part, and they all walk through on dry ground. And then to make matters even better, there comes the armies of Pharaoh after them, and they're totally wiped out when the waters return. Wouldn't that be a faith builder? But you know, it seems like when our faith is built on things, even like that, it's short-lived. Faith that is built upon the Word of God remains. Well, they leave, they, they have their great celebration that day, and then they take off across the wilderness. And they start walking, and they walk, and they walk. And uh, they travel about 45 miles until they realize something serious has happened. They've been going in circles. They're only about 12 miles from where they started. Three days they've been walking and they've only gone 12 miles from, from after where they crossed the sea. Walking in circles. Why? And they come to the pool of Mara. Their water is gone now. They come to the pool of Mara and it's bitter. It's bitter. They look into the pool. And what do they see? Basically what they're seeing is a reflection of what's in their heart. Bitterness. Bitterness. When there's bitterness in your heart, you never get closer to God. When you allow your heart to become bitter, you can guarantee this, you're never going any farther with God than you are at that point. The bitterness will stop you cold. God knows that until they get the bitterness out of their heart, they are not going to see the promised land. And this is one of the dangers of today. We're seeing so much bitterness within the church, and people are saying, why isn't God moving? Why can't we get past this thing? It's because of bitterness will keep you walking in circles. You go round and round and round and round and you never get any farther with God until you get rid of the bitterness. God will not allow bitterness in his kingdom. God will not work in your life if there's bitterness. He has to get it out. We would like to see miracles, don't we? Why don't we see more of them? Told did a story one time years ago. We went into a church. And the pastor told me about this couple that they were just, he said, do you see that couple over there? I said, yeah, the couple that looked like they could kill a person. They looked so angry. He said, yeah. He says, I'm going to bring them up to you if you can see them. You can get them. And so they, he brought this couple up to us. And this lady, she was sitting there and she was in pain and everything and she's an older lady. And I asked her what the problem was. And she said, my bone is deteriorating and she said, if I move quickly, she said, my bones can break. And I can be paralyzed permanently. And then God spoke to me and I said to her, who haven't you forgiven? And she got a look of shock on her face. And she said, 
my son and his wife. They couldn't get along and they didn't like being parents so they left their two teenage boys with, with uh, my husband and I and they took off and they left two very angry, disappointed teenagers who are so hard to handle, they're fighting all the time, they're arguing, and they make our life just terrible, and then I get all upset, and then I fall, I have a seizure, I fall, and then my bones break, and I'm back in the hospital again. And the doctor said, one more time you will not get up. One more time you'll be crippled the rest of your life. And she said, it's all because of my son and his wife, they won't deal with their own responsibilities. Well, and I said to her, if you want to be healed, you have to first forgive. And I said, I want you to pray and forgive your son and his wife. Would you do that? And she said, okay. She bowed her head. And she prayed and asked God to forgive her for being angry. And she asked, she asked God to take away the bitterness in her heart as she forgave her son and his wife. Now she had a good reason, didn't she, for being angry. But it was still holding her in a running of service. She couldn't get any fun. And so she prayed. And she set her son and his wife free that day. And after she got done praying, I said, now let's pray for your healing. And we prayed for her healing. And she said, let me stand up and see if I can do it without pain. She rose to her feet. She said, I have no pain, no pain. She sat down and she said, let me do it again. And she jumped to her feet this time. And she said, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Because she got rid of that bitterness in her spirit. We came back a year later. That same church. And there sat that man and his wife with grins on their faces. And the, the pastor said, they haven't quit smiling since you left last time. When God healed them. The children of Israel had a reason for being bitter. Can you imagine having the whip beat on your back? They were slaves. They were slaves their whole life. And we don't know exactly how long. But these people were slaves. And they were mistreated day after day after day. They watched their families killed. They watched their friends being killed. They were slaves in a foreign land. And we can say, okay, they had a reason for being bitter for what they had gone through. And God said, there is no reason. There is no justifiable reason for bitterness. You've got to let it go. If you can't forgive, it'll build and get bigger and bigger and bigger until it destroys you. You have to forgive. You have to leave the past in Egypt. Leave it in your past and don't dig it up anymore. That doesn't change a thing. You have to forgive and get the bitterness and anger out of your heart. It's the only way to get get past it. God that day at the pool he told the people there's only one way out you'll never quit going in circles you will not get past this place until you forgive and get rid of your bitterness he says I am Jehovah Jehovah Rophi the Lord who heals. You see, the healing that was needed that day was not a physical healing. It was a healing of the spirit. The healing of the spirit. 
They could not go any farther until they were willing to drop the cords of their slavery that they were still hanging on to. They had to drop them and leave them in Egypt. They crossed out of Egypt, but they still were tied to it by their bitterness. They were disappointed with God. They cried to the Lord and he didn't come right away. It got worse. They cried to the Lord and he sent Moses, but then it made it even worse. They cried to God and Pharaoh would not let him go. Now they cried to God and they don't have anything to drink. One of the greatest causes of bitterness is disappointment with God because we don't understand what he's doing. God is still Jehovah Rophi. How many people today are bound by unforgiveness? And I've talked to a lot of people and they said, but you don't know what that man or that woman did to me. I have a right to be better. All right, you may have a right to be bitter, but then plan on this. This is going to be your home from now on. You're not moving one step closer to God. You're, there's no freedom. You will never move from the place you're at right now until you give it to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your healing in my spirit. Now, I can say these things because I've had to go through this myself. I think we all have, haven't we? We've had people that have disappointed us. We have had people that have hurt us. The only way to get past and move into the place of God's blessing where we begin to experience the answers to prayer. We begin to experience the peace that passes understanding. We begin to experience a joy that is our strength. We want to get there. We want to leave this place. We want to get there. But then we have to drop the cords of the things that have held us as slaves. So I've had enough of it. I release it. These people demonstrated that didn't set it free, set them free. They shouted at Moses, that didn't help. Moses took the tree and threw it in the end of the water. The water became sweet. The tree that holds healing today is that tree on which Jesus hung at the end of Christ is the only one who can set us free. He is the only way out. We refuse Jesus Christ. There is no way out. There's no getting rid of bitterness without Jesus. But when we give our heart to Jesus Christ, there is freedom. There is joy unspeakable and full of glory. There is fellowship. There is hope for the future. America is bound just like Egypt. Or just like Israel when they came out of Egypt. America is bound with hatred, bitterness, anger. We need the healing hand of God in America the healing hand of God. And the only way I've heard people say, well, how can I get there? How can I forgive? I tried and tried and tried. How can I? We have to understand who God is. I am Jehovah Rophi, the Lord who heals, the Lord who restores. He is the one 
who will bring us out and set us free. But we have to trust his word. Trust what he says that he is. And cling to him. And there is freedom. There is freedom. You'll never be able to move forward with God. Until you find first come to that point where you cling to the cross and say, Lord, you are the God who heals. You are the only one who can take the bitterness out of my heart. You work the miracle. Make me a new person. Lord, that my eyes will be on you and not on my past. I release it in Jesus' name. I release it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you are the God who heals. Lord, you know how many times we've been hurt. You know the things that have gone on in our lives. And Lord, it's just something that is pulling people apart. Lord, we pray that no matter who is listening right now, no matter what the situation is, they've been hurt, they've been, people have abused them. Maybe it's somebody that they love. But they've been disappointed. And they've been hurt. God, we pray that you would just help that one right now. Be it here in the sanctuary or in a living room watching on television or in another country in the world watching on the computer. Lord, help them to say in the name of Jesus Christ, I release that person that hurt me. I forgive them in the name of Jesus. I drop the cords that are holding me to them. The bitterness, I release them. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive them. And forgive me for holding them in bondage with bitterness. Heal me. Heal my spirit right now. And help me, Lord, to be able to not anymore walk in service but to move forward with Jesus Christ. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to close this morning. We're turning our hymn book to number 607. 607. What we have found is so many times we come to this area of forgiving people. People come just so far and then they put the brakes on. And they say, you don't know how bad I've been hurt. And they will not leave it alone. But where God leads you, follow him. Say, Lord, you want me to, look to, to forgive, I will release them. I will forgive them and I will go forward with you. I, where you lead me, I'll follow. I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, I can hear my Savior calling, take my cross and follow. Oh. Uh -huh.
Father, we thank you that you gave your word. I am the Lord thy God who healeth thee. You have the power to back it up. And when Moses took that tree and threw it in the water, the water became sweet. And we know, Lord, that life becomes sweet when we get rid of the bitterness. And Lord, we know that so today, as I have shared this word, saw a reflection of their own spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would just help them now to say, Lord, I don't want any more of that. I give my bitterness away. Put the water, put the tree in the, in the water. Make it sweet. Give me a sweet spirit that glorifies God. Because I don't want to live here forever. I want to follow you wherever you lead me. Until he brings me to the throne of God. Where I'll have a new body, a new mind, a new life. At the throne of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the future that we have in you. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise me in all creatures here below. Praise him above me. Praise Father, Son, and 